Hey, Cumberland Online Campus, this is Pastor Matt, and it's an honor for me to be here. I really appreciate Pastor Courtney open up some space for me to share today God's Word. And man, I've been really excited about this Sermon on the Mount that Jesus has been teaching us so much for. So before we get right into it, can I just say a prayer for us? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much, God, for your Holy Word. Thank you for this message that Jesus gave us that we can then translate to common day language for us now. Lord, we're praying, God, you do a work and you speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. The Word of God says, Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. <laughs> hey, I'm glad we got the lights on. I was a little worried about if we paid the electric bill around here, but that's good. Light is good, right? Isn't it feel good to be walking in the light and to experience the light? It's significant to me that one of the very first verses in the whole Bible in the book of Genesis during the creation story, that God actually started with the words, let there be light. And he created this light to dispel the darkness. It's good to be in the light. John 3.16, most of us know that one, but do you recall maybe what John 3.19 says? Check out what it says here in the Message Bible uh, translation says, this is the crisis we are in. God's light streamed into the world, but men and women everywhere ran for darkness because they were not really interested in pleasing God. <laughs> uh, in fact, I, I think I kind of know what you're thinking right now. When you just heard that verse read, you're like, yeah, Pastor Matt, tell him, right? Yeah, the world is full of darkness. It just seems like the darkness is everywhere. And people are running from the light. People are running away from Jesus. People are running away from the truth. People are running away from the church. And, you know, there is a little problem with that thinking for those of us that may already know Jesus. When we think of the world or people in the world like that, you know what the problem is? We're conveniently leaving ourselves out of the picture <laughs> because we ourselves have been caught at times walking away from the light and dabbling in the shadows. Come on, can we be real? Can, can I be real with you right now where you're at <laughs> and hear me on this? That everybody has struggles with the temptation of darkness. Everybody sometimes just wants to get away from the light so that they can play or escape into the darkness. And so I hope I'm not only preaching to myself here, right? Um, so be, before we can talk about people in spiritual darkness, we've got to first admit it that we ourselves are in it and struggle with it occasionally too. Listen, I know some of you out here are listening to me right now and a couple of you are perfect. So I'm not gonna talk to you. I'm just gonna talk to the rest of us, me and the rest of us here, that here's the truth. The word of God says this, Jesus is the light of the world and in him is no darkness at all. Did you hear that? In Jesus, there's no darkness at all. So here's the thing. The closer I get to the light or the Jesus, the more imperfections are exposed in me. The more I love Jesus, sometimes the worse I look. Now, that, that's not how Jesus wants us to feel. We, we need to have a sense of like, oh, man, I'm, I'm convicted. Oh, man, the Holy Spirit's prompting me to change. Oh, man, I, 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 I'm feeling a little bit of that guilt. That's that's OK. That's, that's exactly where God wants to call us into moments of what's called repentance, where we say, okay, God, clean me. I'm dirty. Uh, Lord, your light's exposing. Let me give you an example. Like, like right now, I'm sitting here in this really cool space, and light is on me. In fact, it's kind of a bright light. It's pretty warm. I feel it, right? And so I'm in the light. While I'm in the light right now, you might go, uh, Pastor Matt, um, you in that light, I noticed that you're getting some more grays in your beard than I saw last time you were speaking. Well, yeah, you're right. I'm getting older and light exposes these imperfections. OK, I'm not so sure grays imperfect imperfection, but it, or you might say, oh, hey, uh, Master Matt, um, I see a little like stain on your shirt right there. What would you get into right there for lunch or a little coffee spill? What going on there? Or, hey, I, in, since you're in that bright light, Matt, I see a little sweat bead forming right there. But here's the thing. If I was in the shadows with you right now, sitting with you in the shadows, you wouldn't hardly see any of that. 
you got my point, right? The closer I, we get to Jesus, the more exposure there is. By the way, that's a good thing because he's a good father and he wants to help us through our imperfections. That's called grace. Amen. I mean, Jesus, the very presence of Jesus, who the Bible says there is no darkness at all in him because he's perfect light. He illuminates the truth. And that's a good thing. All of us who follow him, we've got to put aside our preferences for darknesses and shadows. And we got to learn to live in the light. Matthew chapter four, we're about ready to get into our Matthew chapter five passage real quick. But look at Matthew chapter four. This one verse says that people who were once living in darkness have seen a great light. Amen. So this brings us to our text in chapter five. And Pastor Courtney, the last couple of weeks, has been speaking on the Beatitudes at the beginning of this Sermon on the Mount, which is a famous message that Jesus preached through Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And it's his first public discourse um, that he's sharing his truth and the message as he is the light of the world, right? And so I'm going to give us some uh, context and historical context and background to the passage we're going to look at in just a minute. But let's go ahead and read it. Matthew chapter 5. Let's start in verse 13. You, this is Jesus speaking, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to the entire house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Man, that's our passage today. We're going to look at that and break it down. But here's the historical context of this that the Roman Empire has been expanding 2,000 years ago when Jesus was standing there on this hill in Galilee, right, right by the Lake of Galilee. And he's speaking this at a time frame when the political power was with the Romans. And they had guard and they had been conquering more and more territory. And so they were oppressing whoever they would overcome, whatever nation and nationality, whatever country. And so right now, the Israel people, the Jewish nation, were under um, the occupancy of the Roman Empire. They were being colonized and they were being forced with their laws and their customs and their culture. And the power structure was in the hands of the Romans. So listen to me. This is important that the Jewish people had to learn to live in the shadows to survive, just to exist. They had to play along with the status quo. They had to be very careful about what they spoke about when it comes to uh, the Roman Empire or the Roman law or the Roman culture. That They had to be very careful because this is real. Like if they went against the Roman culture or laws, they could be obviously arrested. Many times they were beaten into submission. Sometimes they were even killed for opposing the Roman Empire. And so realizing this, Jesus is talking to this crowd of people who are oppressed by, by this nation, the Roman Empire. And he's saying to them, hey, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to follow God, you've got to learn and understand to live in the light. You've got to be a little brighter and a little saltier. You've got to be the salt and the light of this world. And guess what? There's going to be risk. You're going to have to have supernatural courage. It's going to take that kind of courage to survive in this time. This was 2000 years ago. So you can feel like this nudge of Jesus now. He just came through the Beatitudes. And isn't it interesting that just last Sunday, Pastor Court was reminding us of the word persecution. Jesus re told him, he's like, guys, if you follow me, there will be persecution in, for my name. And so he's, he's given them a fair warning and notice that for us, in order for us to be true salt and light, it's going to be risky. And it's going to have to take that supernatural courage to do this. So following Jesus, it's a daily pursuit, right? You and I are trying daily to follow Jesus, to fall more in love with Jesus. He's the perfect light. We're trying to find, uh, find from him our strength as we seek Jesus. It is a personal and a private and a growing relationship with the God of the universe through Jesus, right? 
And so like Pastor Court says, almost every Sunday, these are the words he says, seek his face so we can give away his heart. Notice that there's something really unique in this declaration that we say every Sunday. It is both a private declaration of faith and a public declaration of faith. We're privately seeking the vertical relationship with God, but then we're commissioned and we declare that we will give away his heart. There's that horizontal relationship that God wants us to engage. Our culture, our world, our neighbors, our coworkers, sometimes our own family who may not know Jesus yet. So God's calling us in this passage to be salt and light. In fact, let me say this, that authentic faith is both private and public. It, it can't be either or, or just one or the other. That, and I would say this, a lot of you have heard this over the years, that integrity is doing the right thing when nobody's looking. But let me also say, integrity is doing the right thing when everybody is looking. And so who are we, not just in private, but in public? Do we represent the true salt in the, of this earth and the light of this world? Are we a reflection of the illumination of Jesus himself? And so, man, when I, when I think of Cumberland, we, the church family, whether you're online or you're partially in person with us at times, we want you to know here, Cumberland, we take this serious. That yes, we're about pursuing the heart of God, but we're also about giving it away to our community. And man, Cumberland is all about that. That's why actually um, Cumberland has a whole department called Outside the Walls. That's why we're reaching out intentionally into your living room right now to say, hey, we want to reach people that may not come on campus and be with us in person. We want to reach our neighborhood and our, our, our school district. And we want to be a blessing to those around us that we don't even have. We don't even know just yet. We want to be true salt and true light. And so outside the walls exist for that very reason. In fact, we have a global outreach that expands all around the world with four ministry partnerships, one in India, one in Greece, one in Kenya, and a new one that was established just recently down in Ecuador, because we want to be the light of the world and reach the world with the light of Jesus. So even our Cumberland Counseling Center that's possibly, you know, exist here on our campus started a new site in Lawrenceville, Georgia recently. And between the two of them just last year in 2021, we were able to be the salt and light of Jesus to 260 some families and people that needed counseling services. And it's gospel centered and it's clinical, and it's helpful, and it's healing. And if maybe even that's something you need that might reach out to us and let us know, we can even do it virtually and set up counseling sessions. That's the important part of being salt and light is exposing ourselves to those in the world that might need Jesus or might need truth or might need a little warmth of the light of God. And then we have what's called our FIA, Faith in Action, that our Outside the Walls does. And that's coming up in less than a month. We're going to be at Fair Oaks Elementary School coming up in March. And maybe that's something you can join us, uh, you know, come out of virtual for a little bit and help us join us there at the campus if you wish. You're invited. We hope you can join us. And that's another way that we can bless the public school system by God's people going out into the community and literally being hands and feet of Jesus on the ground. During the pandemic, we've given out hundreds and thousands of pounds of food to people in need during the pandemic. And then uh, the peace truck, we have this mobile peace unit that we take out into the neighborhoods and especially to our apartment brothers and sisters in the community around us and to public schools, wherever we can go with it. And so that thing's about ready to get resurrected. It had a little mechanical issue, but it's coming back. Get ready. You're going to see the peace truck out there. We believe that salt and light, as Jesus is asking us to be his salt and light, is actually has a God-given distinctive DNA that can't be changed. You literally cannot change the DNA of salt. You cannot change the DNA of light. But... You can because they're meant to actually affect their environment around them. That's why Jesus is you the, using this illustration. But what you can do is you can dilute the salt where it's not as salty by putting other imp imperfect material with it. Or you can obstruct the light 
and keep it from shining brightly as it was intended. And so that's exactly in this passage that we just read. That's what Jesus is concerned about. That's what he's kind of warning us about. He's almost making it this ridiculous thing like, what? How could salt lose its saltiness? That's terrible. It would just be trampled underfoot. What? How would light not shine brightly? That's the purpose of it. Why would you obstruct that light? Why would you put an object in front of it? And so that's exactly what Jesus is trying to say. In fact, notice, I think this is interesting in our passage. Jesus doesn't spend any time, as he's talking about salt and light, about salt being too salty or light being too bright. In fact, he addresses the opposite issue. That we, for whatever reason, with our own struggles in humanity, try to shelter the light from those around us or we lose our saltiness. That's what Jesus is truly concerned about. <laughs> I've got a question for you uh, to make this to make a point of this. Um, have you ever heard of an organization throughout the nation called Habitat for Humanity? Is that, does that ring a bell? Have you ever heard of that? Habitat for Humanity, many people have heard of throughout the nation, and it, it's got attention in every city in America where they want to help increase home ownership for folks that can't afford it. And so they help build homes with donated materials and donated people, volunteers, mostly the church, people of God come out and build these homes. And then they literally turn over the keys to a deserving family or so that they can have home ownership for the very first time. It's an incredible program. Do you know how it started? Yeah, there's some beautiful history of this story. The history of this, this young white uh, Southern Baptist pastor in South rural Georgia, near Americus, Georgia, back in 1942. Listen to what Clarence Jordan, the pastor, said. And what people said about him was he was the most authentic Christian people had ever met. Because Clarence Jordan said, you know what? It's 1942, and I'm sick and tired of racism. I'm sick and tired of the church neglecting its, uh, its purpose to be true salt and true light, representing the truth of all of God's people. You know what he decided to do? This dude went ahead and bought a 100-acre farm in south rural Georgia, and he said, this farm is dedicated to God Almighty. In fact, this farm is going to be a place where white brothers and sisters and black brothers and sisters will live together on the farm in equity, where they will have the same conditions to live in. They will farm on this land together as one people, and we will reap the harvest together, and we will all get paid equally the exact amount for our time and our labor and our work. And then finally, he said, we're going to worship God together together as one people. And man, uh, that, that did not come, by the way, without resistance. Can I remind you that Jesus, the light of the world, has an enemy? And when you follow the light, you take on this enemy too, Satan, the devil, right? And so Satan and his followers, man, they don't want anything to do with the light. They try to shun the light, extinguish the light, get rid of the saltiness. And so Clarence Jordan and his family and all those folks that lived on that farm, by the way, it started in 1942. Here we are in 2022, 80 years later, it's still going. In fact, it was out of that farming community that Habitat for Humanity was birthed out of that humble and obedient mission of people of God saying, we will be the salt and light of our town, of our community, of our country and our state of Georgia. And even though there was great resistance from the Klan and others that tried to shoot bullets in them, one time they were even bombed, there was great oppression because there is an enemy. And so when we take on this seriousness of, the, of this mission that God's given us of, hey, let's really be the salt, let's really be the light, that there's risk involved in truly following Jesus. Clarence Jordan, the pastor, over a, a period of time would go into a prayer closet on the farm and he would begin to write the New Testament in a Southern vernacular translation. And it's called the Cotton Patch Gospels of all things. That's what he titled it. And uh, he, he uh, endearingly put together God's word in a vernacular that would make sense to us. And I want to read you the portion that Jesus is trying to communicate in this gospel, according to Clarence Jordan. Listen to what he says. 
and it has kind of a southern, southern flavor. He says, y'all are the earth's salt. But now if you just sit there and don't salt, how would the world ever get salted? Y'all be worthless that you'll be thrown out and trampled out by the rest of society. Y'all are the world's light. You are a city on a hill that cannot be hid. Have you ever heard of anybody turning on a light and then covering it up? Don't you fix it so that it will light up the whole room? Well then, since you are God's light, which he has turned on, go ahead and shine so clearly that when your conduct is observed, it will be plainly be the work of your spiritual father in heaven. I'm not sure about you, but that is so convicting and refreshing at the same time that God is calling us followers of Jesus to truly be salt and light, actually to be saltier than we are and brighter than we are presently. I'm convicted. I want to be that way. I want to truly live my life where I can be brighter for for Christ, especially in this community that I live in and in the neighborhood that I live in and in the people that I connect with on a daily basis. But can I be honest with you? I think we're asking the wrong question sometimes when we say, yeah, but Matt, I don't want to be too salty. I don't want to be too bright. I don't want to, I don't want to offend people with my faith. I don't want to, I don't want to come across that way. And I would say, yeah, good. I'm glad you feel that way. I don't want to come across that way either. Let's, let's not be like preachy or arrogant or condemning or, you know, let's not be that way. That's not what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about being a light of love and grace. That's why the Beatitudes preceded what he was saying right here in this passage that we're looking at today. But uh, I think we're asking the wrong question of what will others think of me? The question should be, what will God think of me? My heavenly father who's given me this light to reflect. And I have to ask myself, what object am I using to impede the light that God is trying to shine through me? Is it maybe an object of pride or an object of fear, an object of embarrassment? Whatever that object might be that, that's obstructing the light of Christ shining through us. Romans 1.16 says, Paul writes, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everybody who believes. Jesus even said in Matthew chapter 10, Whoever denies me before men, I'll also deny them before the Father. But let me give you this last hope. He also said in the same breath, But whoever proclaims me before men, I will proclaim him before my Father too. So it's a decision we all got to make. Man, God wants us to be salt and light, to be saltier than we are right now and brighter than we are right now so we can truly love our community well in the name of Jesus. You know, we gather here weekly so we can scatter the rest of the week so that we can be illuminating our community with the light of Jesus Christ. Here at Cumberland, and you guys do this weekly with us too, we have this experience we call communion where we take the bread and the cup, the juice, that remind us of the body of Jesus Christ that was shed for us and the blood of Christ that was shed for us. And so we're reminded of that each week that we come together. And it helps us to, uh, the Bible says, take an examination of yourself. Look at yourself and make sure that you're in right standing with God. Again, there's that that, that vertical re, uh, perspective so that we can then go horizontal and share with others. And so right now, as we get ready to take this bread, I want you along with myself to say, God, what is it that I have used to obstruct the light that you want me to shine brighter? What is it, Lord? Is it maybe sin or a struggle or fear or shame? What is it, Lord, that is in me that I need to ask you to cleanse me of right now? And so as you take the bread, we take and eat that we're reminded of the body of Christ, the sacrifice he gave for us. The Bible says in the same way that night he took the cup and he said, this is the blood of the new covenant. Drink from it, all of you. Let's drink. Here in these moments, we're reminded we are during communion, seeking his face so we can give away his heart and he can build his church.